Welcome back to Sidebar here on Law and Crime. I'm Ian Jeanette Levy. The jury is set. Eight women and 10 men will hear the case against Lori Vallow Daybell in the Doomsday Cult Mom trial in Boise, Idaho. The trial, of course, was moved to Ada County, Idaho from Fremont County, uh, where these homicides occurred. Six of these jurors are alternate alternates, but they don't know which six are the alternates and which are not. So that will be determined at the end of the case. And the jury has been told apparently that this case could last eight weeks. Imagine that. So uh, there are no cameras, unfortunately. Lori Vallow Daybell is accused of murdering her two children, her adopted son, JJ Vallow, and her teenage daughter, Tylee Ryan, who prosecutors say she believed were zombies. Vallo Daybell is also accused of conspiring to murder Tammy Daybell, the late wife of her current husband, Chad Daybell, who's being tried separately. So their trials were recently severed. Law and Crimes Gigi McKelvey is in Ada County, Idaho. She's been there all week long inside the courtroom, inside the courthouse. Gigi, uh, tell us uh, how this process went. It was, seems like obviously always a tedious process to pick a jury. So tell us what you observed. It was tedious. It was hearing a lot of the same questions over and over and over with different people. It was interesting to watch the, or to hear the jury and how much they knew or how much they didn't know about the case. I would say majority knew something, whether it's just a name or little things like she was in Hawaii without her kids. They were looking for her kids. So it, but then they gave a lot of the same examples of, circumstantial evidence for example they gave the example with a lot of the jurors you tell your kid they can't have a cookie then you go out of the room come back in the room the kids got crumbs on their face chocolate the cookie jars open is it reasonable to say the kid probably ate the cookie most people said yes i remember one guy who said well i would have to question the child first and then make my decision and then one person said, I would have to see the kid eat the cookie. So it was interesting, the different answers. Overall, people said, yeah, I would probably assume because what they're leading into is this might be a very circumstantial case against Lori. Well, that's interesting you bring up the cookie analogy. They love to use that one. Prosecutors want a juror who doesn't have to see uh, the kid eating the cookie. They also use that rain analogy like, well, you didn't see it rain. You didn't hear it rain, but you go outside and the grass is wet. Do you think it's do you think it rained? Uh, So it's interesting when they always pull out these old little things and question jurors, potential jurors about them. Lori Vallow Daybell, as we know, Gigi, was deemed incompetent to stand trial at one point in time. She had her competency restored. We never learned what her particular mental health issues were, but we we know she has them. Uh, we assume that she's receiving medication for those. I interviewed an author yesterday who uh, described her as a complete narcissist or a total narcissist. So what are you observing from Lori Vallow Daybell? Because all we have right now are sketches. There are no cameras in the courtroom, unfortunately. She's very much involved in her defense. And that's part of competency is being able to assist in your defense. If you remember towards the end of the year last year, it was brought into question again by Jim Archibald about her competency. Very quickly, they turned it around and said she is competent. And we've seen that all week. This is a very different Lori Vallow to me in that courtroom. It's not the kind of looking around everywhere, grinning at inappropriate times. She's writing on a legal pad. She is talking to both of her attorneys on a regular basis, uh, just very involved in the whole process. And today during the strikes, I don't think I've seen her more focused than she was during the 20 minutes where they were striking those jurors. She had her hand right in the middle of that from what we could see. That's interesting. Did her attorneys seem to be, uh, as far as you could tell, taking her advice? I mean, I mean, do they seem to be looking at what she's telling them and, and then doing what she wants? Yeah, I mean, they were definitely listening to her and there was active discussion sometimes between all three and then sometimes with just her and one attorney or the other. It does seem like they were listening to her very intently. She made notes all week. So whether or not she was making notes about these jurors as they came up, we don't know. She could have been doodling for all we know. But she was referring back to those notes during the strike process. So I do think maybe she made notes of, I don't like this one, I do like that one. There were certain jurors as well that she seemed to focus in on a little more than others. And I really haven't found a common thread 
But I did notice yesterday there was one juror who was 22, very young, and it, it was a female. So you think about it, had Tylee not been murdered, she would have been kind of close to that age. You wonder, we couldn't see that juror. Did she maybe favor Tylee a little bit? Lori didn't take her eyes off that juror. That was interesting to me. And she also tends to listen more intently to what sounds like middle-aged women, women around her age to kind of get the feel for it. Um, and yeah, oddly enough, I didn't see her looking at the men too much, but maybe after five husbands, she's kind of tired of looking at, at, at men in that way. Good point. Good point. Uh, it seems she likes the husband she has now though. Uh, the, you know, something that's kind of going through my mind, given what we've been told in this case is the fact that she and Chad Daybell and her brother thought they could see people who were inhabited by zombies. It makes you wonder, does she, if she does indeed truly believe that, is she looking at these people and wondering if they're zombies? I know that sounds silly, but it makes me wonder if she's thinking she can see something. Yeah. And I mean, we've never heard officially, but the rumblings we have heard about Lori is that she still very much believes what she did the day she was arrested. So that she could have been writing down light and dark scales for all these jurors for all we know. But, uh, you know, it is interesting. It's hard to know what goes in her thought process, what goes on up there. I mean, does she ever stop and think about her kids? Does she ever realize the gravity of what has happened? You know, a lot of people think that she's just evil. A lot of people acknowledge there could be mental illness. Maybe it's a mixture of both. But she's she's hard to read in that regard. But she's not hard to read in when she's very interested in something because she laser focuses. She definitely has the ability to stop what she's doing and focus in on one particular juror, which she did several times throughout this process. Do we know if the lot, a lot of the jurors in this case, uh, you know, perspective and otherwise were... Mormons or, you know, participate in the Mormon faith? We were not, I never personally heard any specific uh, questions posed to any of the jurors about what faith they practice. Sometimes they would pose the question if somebody believes something that's radically different from the religious beliefs you have, would you be able to put that aside and make a fair and impartial judgment against Lori Vallow? Most said yes. In fact, yesterday, one guy flat out said no. He said, if somebody's beliefs are fundamentally different than mine, then I would have a hard time setting that aside. And they gave the example of reading some plates and also like interpreting some, some kind of instructions. So I think it's going to come into the whole Moroni thing that went on in the, in the text messages between them. I'm, I'm not sure. But they were asking very specific questions that I believe have to do with the Mormon faith. But it was never asked, are you LDS? Are you Mormon? Anything like that. One final question I have. The last time we saw Lori Vallow Daybell in court, it was during that hearing where she appeared to be smiling quite broadly. Um, it was right after, I believe, that it, it had been determined that her competency had been restored. Are we seeing that from her? No. It's like I say, it's like a light switch. It, it was, I was curious to see how she was going to react in that courtroom during this process, because you can go one or two ways. You can try to just convince the jury that you're, you're not really there and that maybe they see you acting a little um, inappropriate for what you're doing and, and try to embed that in somebody's head. But it was the opposite. It was just laser focused. None of this looking around, smiling, grinning, anything like that. She was there with from what we could see now it's a very small screen in the overflow room we cannot see facial expressions we can tell it's Lori. that's about it but from everything that we saw she was business 100 percent this week it didn't seem like there was any uh drifting off and and going someplace else she was right there in the middle of her attorneys and in the middle of most conversations the entire week well, Gigi, uh, you're a trooper to sit through all of that, tweeting all of that. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we know you'll be there throughout the following week as well. And uh, we're looking forward to see what both sides present. Recently, I spoke with former Idaho Attorney General Dave Leroy about just how big this case is for the gem state. It's an opportunity to show that uh, we can conduct even under controversial, uh, world significant, highly publicized uh, trial circumstances, a fair and impartial trial uh, here in Idaho uh, in an efficient, professional way. Uh, Judge Boyce has shown that he's going to command control of the courtroom. Uh, both the defense and the prosecution have shown some able early moves, and uh, I would expect it to be a, 
a classic trial of uh, a woman on circumstantial evidence with uh, a very significant uh, attention paid to all of the facts and all of the motion maneuvers, all of the legal rulings. This is the most highly publicized trial in Idaho in recent memory. Dave Leroy recalls the last trial in Idaho that received this much attention was back in the early 1900s. It was the murder trial of a man named Harry Orchard. He was represented by Clarence Darrow, the legendary criminal defense attorney. Back then, of course, they didn't have TV cameras in the courtroom. And in Lori Vallow Daybell's trial, they're simply just not being allowed. Well, that's my, one manifestation of uh, Judge Boyce's intent to control this trial. He's not going to let it be a, a circus trial, a show trial. He's going to try to focus on the facts, focus on the law, uh, focus on proper procedure uh, by giving at the end, either each session or each day quite promptly, an audio recording. Uh, he will allow the media and the public uh, to participate in a properly constitutional fashion. Law and Crime, of course, will have those audio recordings for you each day. Leroy also told me a little bit about the evidence that he expects to hear. There'll be a good deal of scientific evidence. There'll be some reconstructive evidence. We'll see some cell phone evidence. Uh, so it will have both a uh, very curious aspect of this overlay of uh, the, the uh Mormon uh, theory of the end of the world and the, the prophet and zombies, uh, as the children were alleged to be, a, a very curious component. And that's it for this edition of Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law and Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.